Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, and good evening to our folks that are watching us on live stream. My name is Rick McGahee. I'm the director of the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Program here at the New School, and also a fellow of SEPA, the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. And it's my pleasure to uh, just kick off the event briefly, one in a great series of uh, events that have been held on climate change issues. Um, for those of you tweeting or looking for tweets, uh, we have, are trying to keep up with the social media, so it's hashtag CCECon if you want to tweet or follow on Twitter. Uh, but it's mostly my role to welcome you all on behalf of SEPA and turn it over to Professor Willie Semler from the Economics Department. Yes. Thank you very much, Rick. So, um, good evening. I'm Willy Semmler from the member of the Economics Department and a fellow at the SIPA, the Schwarz Center for Economic Policy Analysis. Uh, I help to organize the research and conferences and workshops at the SIPA. Um, these uh, conferences uh, have one uh, big theme, which is climate, the economics of climate change. Um, uh, we also, I want to welcome, of course, the audience, uh, also colleagues from the other division and colleagues from our division, but in particular I want to welcome uh, uh, Geoffrey Heal. I will say something about him in a second. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the SIPA uh, staff, in particular um, Teresa Giulia Ducci, who is the uh, uh, director of the SIPA and uh, Rafaela Chappé who is assisting me with this event, but in particular Bridget Fischer who is the uh, associate director of uh, the um, SIPA and uh, they are uh, heavily involved in the uh, organization of this uh, event. Uh, this event is um, a part of a longer uh, speaker series. Um, we had uh, received uh, grants from the Thyssen Foundation, from the Walker Foundation, from uh, the German um, Macroeconomic Institute in Germany, Düsseldorf, the German Consulate in New York, and also from the German Science Foundation to uh, undertake a series of uh, well, f you, conferences, workshop, research activities, and uh, in recent times, we, uh, since two years, we are having a speaker series, a public speaker series, which is mainly funded by uh, Thyssen Foundation and the German Science Foundation. And um, this um, research and those activities, to a great extent, went into the handbook that you see on your seat. It's now out 750 pages. Don't try to read it in one night or evening. <laughs> And there are 25 contributions from uh, experts in different areas of, uh, of climate change issues. Uh, this just this book just came out, and uh, in the next few days it will be on the market. So we had uh, a large number of uh, well, speakers already here on this uh, public in this pu public speaker series. Uh, Mark Jacobson from Stanford on renewable energy. Uh, we had uh, the um, Commissioner for Climate Change from Europe here, um, Ada Runga Metzka, and we had uh, a huge panel discussion with uh, climate scientists and economists here. We had also uh, Michael Oppenheimer here from the IPCC, and uh, today we will have uh, Geoffrey Heal here. Uh, Geoffrey will um, speak about uh, what would it take to reach a climate agreement? We had so many um, in, um, substantive discussions, substantive uh, in, with respect to areas, important areas of climate change, but uh, uh, climate change uh, policies move on, move on only if there are certain agreements. And um, Geoffrey Heal is an expert on this. Uh, Geoffrey is the um, Donald Wade Professor of Social Enterprise at Columbia University at the Business School. He has, uh, he is well known for numerous contributions in economic theory and in uh, particular resources and um, uh, environmental economics. Uh, he has published 18 books and almost 200 um, um, uh, scientific academic papers. His recent books are, for example, Nature and the Marketplace, 
interesting title already. Valuing the Future, also an important title. Uh, when Principles Pay, and The Whole Earth Economics, which is a forthcoming uh, book. He is also uh, in political, uh, high-level political committees very active, uh, shared a committee of National Academy of Sciences on valuing ecosystems. Um, he was a commissioner of the Pew Oceans Commission. Uh, he was also a member of the Sarkozy Commission on Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, where you probably have heard uh, economic activity on success and welfare should not be only measured by the um, GDP per capita, but there is more which uh, increases welfare of the society. And, but this is usually not easy to measure, and uh, Jeff was in, is involved in this. He is also advisor and on advisory board of the uh, World Bank, uh, special uh, activities, particular uh, on green projects and uh, United Nations uh, environmental programs. And uh, Jeff is also uh, an entrepreneur. He has uh, started, two, started two startup companies, which still, I think, exist. This is important. And um, he is a member of, uh, or was member of the Investment Committee of Green Private Equity Group. And you may know that there is some movement at the New School of Divestment from uh, Fossil Fuel and a big discussion currently here. I see there are some supporters here. And uh, some uh, supporters, of course, also in a lot of our classes. And so if anybody has their uh, interest to explore this issue, uh, Jeff is the, uh, uh, busy the world expert on this. So um, I have to make a personal note. I have personally gained a lot from his research and his writings. Uh, I've started also about 10, 12 years ago on uh, economics and environment and uh, climate change. And um, his, uh, at, uh, Jeff's research and his thinking in particular, the recent book, Valuing the Future, has uh, influenced our work uh, a lot. So uh, today we will have a talk on what would it take to reach a climate change agreement. And uh, you will see this is a very important talk to move the, all the, uh, the climate issues, the mitigation as well as the adaptation forward. And uh, the recent uh, agreement of US and China that uh, probably Jeff will talk about uh, pushes to the forefront of the climate discussion again. So Jeff, please come. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, Willie, for that very kind introduction. And thank you guys for being here, for your attention. Um, <clears throat> so climate change is... Uh, an interesting and an important problem. Climate change is probably one of the things. Sure, yeah. Climate change is probably one of the things that could um, potentially undo much of the progress that humanity has made over the last couple of millennia. Uh, maybe that and major nuclear outbreak, major outbreaks of nuclear war are the two really significant threats that could destroy, destroy a lot of our civilization. Climate change is obviously less, the less spectacular of the two, uh, but it still has that potential, at least at the extreme. There's a wide range of opinions from the scientific community on how bad climate change might be, but at the extreme end, it could be very, very bad indeed. Uh, and even in the middle, it could be pretty bad as well. So it's really quite important to reach an agreement on a climate change, to reach some agreed policy which will have the effect of uh, removing the risks associated with climate change. And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, now, the climate change problem, as I guess everybody already knows, is caused by every, any country that emits greenhouse gases. And that's every country in the world. So every country in the world is contributing, though obviously not all equally, to the climate problem. And climate change can affect every country in the world. You can't isolate yourself from it. Um, so the conventional wisdom so far has been that, you know, as it affects everybody, as it's caused by everybody, then we should involve everybody in a solution. And that's the way the, the current structure goes. Um, you know, the idea is that everybody has, everybody contributes to the problem, everybody has an interest in solving the problem, so let's bring them all on board. So that's what we've got in the, the principal body for uh, negotiating solutions uh, and implementing solutions, is a thing called the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, UNFC, FCCC, or UNFCCC. 
I always get the number of C's wrong when I, when I say that thing. Uh, it's a horrible set of acronyms. It's a horrible acronym. Anyway, that was set up uh, in spite of its name in 1992. Um, and uh, its aim, as I said, was to try to negotiate a global so solution to the, the climate problem. It's now at 19 annual meetings, um, so-called COPs, conferences of the parties. There's one about to start in Lima, Peru, in a couple of weeks' time. They occur every year in late November and early December. Uh, and there's always a great deal of publicity associated with them. Um, and in spite of having had 19 of them, it's probably fair to say that relatively little has come of them. Uh, we still haven't got a solution to the climate problem. And it's not obviously clear that we're much nearer today than we were uh, you know, 19 years ago, at least in terms of you know, the, the, the agenda that the UNFCCC has set for itself. So why has so little come of these? Um, there's a bunch of different reasons. And in some sense, a lot of the talk is about that. I mean, one of them is that there's actually quite a lot of countries that really don't feel particularly threatened by climate change and don't feel the need for an agreement. If you don't feel threatened by climate change, you don't really have a big, a big incentive to make an agreement. Um, there's some countries that have a huge vested interest in the status quo. Status quo meaning, you know, use of fossil fuels. If you're a fossil fuel exporter, you probably don't care too much about climate change. I mean, you care much more about climate policy than about climate change. You know, if you were Saudi Arabia, would you be worrying about climate change? It's already pretty hot there. Um, a few degrees extra, you might not notice. The lack of ex oil exports, you would certainly notice. So they don't have a terribly strong interest in a, a solution either. On the other hand, you've got other countries uh, that actually see climate change as an existential threat. Uh, if you think of the small island states of the Pacific, and there's some of them. Nice places to be at the moment, wouldn't they? <laughs> very nice places to be just at the moment. Um, but if the sea level rises very much, they'd be terrible places to be. Some of those island states have the maximum height of our sea level of about 10 feet. Uh, sea level could rise by 6 feet by the end of the century. Um, so most of them will be underwater in a high tide or a big storm, and they'd be completely underwater. So some of these places will have to be evacuated. Um, I think on almost any scenario, a lot of these countries will be evacuated by the end of the century. And I've actually done quite a lot of work with the government of Papua New Guinea in the last decade. And uh, Papua New Guinea, as you probably know, is a sort of part of the island archipelago uh, of Indonesia. It's a, a main island plus a lot of small islands. Um, and several of those small islands have actually already been evacuated because of sea level rise. I know these were sort of atolls rather than significant islands, but they were, they were populated. And the people have already been moved off them because in big storms the water goes right over the island. There's nothing left above, above the sea level. Um, now, in that case, it hasn't been too disastrous because there's a main island which is very high above sea level that they can all be moved to. Uh, but if you consider some of the states out there uh, which have, you know, really just, just outlying islands, there's really no main island, um, you know, they, they obviously see climate change, as I said, as an absolutely existential threat. So there's a range of different responses to the climate change threat. Now, the, um, that's one reason it's, it's hard to get a, a, an agreement. The other reason has to do with the structure of the UNFCCC. Uh, it's a very democratic institution, very democratic indeed, um, probably too democratic. Agreement is reached by, quote, consensus, unquote. The uh, sort of the um, bylaws don't actually say what consensus means, but consensus is generally taken to mean unanimity. Uh, so, I mean, just it's, it's actually left to the chairman of the meeting, and the chairman of a COP meeting is always the environment minister of the host country. So this year it will be the environment minister of Peru, who is the chair, and it's left to the chairman of the meeting to judge whether consensus has been reached or not. And some chairs are willing to sort of use their power a little bit and declare a consensus to have been reached if there's a couple of people against it. Other chairs have taken consensus to mean unanimity. Uh, but it always means overwhelming support. Uh, you know, sort of no more than two or three countries against, uh, is the way consensus is interpreted. Um, <clears throat> so that means in particular that, you know, one country can block an agreement. And certainly several countries can block an agreement. And certainly one influential country can block an agreement. So, for example, Saudi Arabia has often blocked agreements. Now, they don't do this in public, so you wouldn't actually see this in the press, but I've actually been a negotiator in these meetings. I was a representative of the government of Papua New Guinea at some of these meetings. And when you get in behind closed doors where there's no press and there's no NGO members present, so there's no reporting on what goes on, the Saudi Arabian representatives are quite happy to block progress. Uh, they know that unanimity is required. They're a significant country, and they and other OPEC members will simply block progress. Now, it shouldn't be a great surprise to anybody. People look after their own economic interests at these events, and um, 
you know, Saudi Arabia's GDP is almost entirely generated by selling oil and gas. And anything which restricts the sales of oil and gas is obviously going to make them worse off. I mean, currently, they are a fairly rich country. Uh, but if the oil and gas sales were to drop off significantly, they would obviously would not be a rich country, and they have very few alternatives. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is basically desert with oil and gas underneath it. So it doesn't have a lot of potential in any other mode of operation. Um, they've also been quite obstructive behind the scenes in the IPCC. Uh, the IPCC is the body that regularly every five or six years produces reports on the state of the climate, the state of our understanding of the climate. Uh, it's sent to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and I'm also involved in that. And again, behind closed doors there, the Saudi Arabian representatives, and every government in the world is represented there, Saudi Arabian rep representatives work very hard uh, to try to minimize the threat of climate change and obstruct any policy recommendations which have to do with moving away from fossil fuels. Now, the IPCC does not work by consensus, so it's not quite so important there. Um, again, another body which is very active in this respect, obviously, is Russia. I mean, Russia is a country of about 45% of whose GDP comes from the sale of oil and gas. Um, in addition, Russia is probably not threatened by climate change. And a lot of Russia is a long way north, awful long way north. And certainly parts of Russia will benefit from climate change. In fact, the north of Russia and the, you know, the north coast of Siberia is already benefiting from climate change. Uh, you know, the, we've, we must all have read about the ice flows up there breaking up, the fact that you've got a possibility of, na of navigation along the north coast of Russia. Um, so that's dead, uh, opening potential for commercial development in the north of Russia, something which was never possible before. So Russia potentially stands to gain from climate change and to lose significantly from policies that, uh, that uh, move against climate change. Um, so, you know, and Russia obviously is a significant player. I mean, no chairman of a meeting would declare unanimity in the face of obstruction by, of, of, of disagreement by Russia. I mean, they might declare unanimity in the face of disagreement by, you know, Nicaragua or Papua New Guinea or somewhere like that, but, but Russia is clearly a player who has a veto uh, in this structure. Um, you know, I mentioned before that climate change poses an existential threat to the small island states, Well, climate policy poses an existential threat to Russia. Uh, at least an, an economic existential threat, not a, not a physical existential threat. Um, so um, we need an alternative to the present framework. You know, negotiating through the UN at C, where we're trying to reach an agreement with every country, I think is a forlorn hope. But we will never reach an agreement with every country. Uh, even if you know, significant numbers of countries reach an agreement, uh, it can still be blocked. So I think that's been an unproductive route to take. I mean, I can understand why we started off down that route. I explained to you earlier that, you know, the, the motivation for this particular way of thinking about things, the idea that you know, every country is contributing to climate change, every country is affected by it, so why don't we try to involve them all in the solution? Um, but I think we need to take another route. And in fact, it's a, you know, since I started writing this talk, that road has actually opened up, uh, as Willie just mentioned right now. Um, and here's what I think is a good route. Um, China as I think you probably know, produces around about a quarter of all global emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. It's gone from almost nothing to producing a quarter of the world's greenhouse gases in roughly the last 15 years. Amazing economic growth. And it's at that stage of economic growth where you know, every one point increase in the growth rate leads to a two or three points increase in the rate of energy consumption. Um, you know, if you look at the curve that relates energy to growth, energy to GDP, it sort of goes up very steeply at the bottom and flattens off. They're on the steep part of it right now. So their uh, energy consumption is rising proportionally faster than their GDP. So anyway, China is producing about a quarter of global emissions. The US used to produce a quarter, but it's now down to 20%, partly because China is producing so much and partly because US emissions have actually fallen. Uh, US emissions have actually fallen 6% roughly in the last five years, which is a good, good trend. That's, you know, mainly because of the replacement of coal by gas, natural gas from fracking, and uh, by wind. Uh, so a lot of coal has been produced, replaced, replaced by, by both uh, gas and wind. In fact, coal used to produce 52% of the electricity produced in the US as little as six years ago. Today it produces 38%. It's actually quite a big drop in the market share of coal. Uh, the Republicans are always complaining about Obama's war on coal. Actually, it's the market that's playing a war on coal. Um, because gas is cheaper and wind is cheaper. I'll show you some numbers in a second. Um, because India is not as big a producer. I mean, India is not industrialized. India's growth so far, A, has been much less than China, and B, has been primarily in the services sector, not in the manufacturing sector. 
I mean, China's growth is entirely in heavy industry, so it's very, very energy intensive. Uh, the, the energy intensity of the Chinese economy is quite extraordinary. But again, it's, that's, you know, that's, uh, because the, it's partly because they're building a huge amount of infrastructure. I mean, India is very lacking in infrastructure. Infrastructure construction generates vast amounts of CO2. I mean, concrete releases, you know, the formation of concrete releases huge amounts of CO2 because uh, you're breaking up calcium carbonate. Um, so anyway, China produces 25% of global emissions, the US roughly 20%, and the European Union roughly 15%. I know mean, those are all, all round numbers. So if you just take those three players together, between them they produce roughly 60% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, so roughly, you know, not, not far off two-thirds of the total emissions. So if we could get an agreement between those three to do something substantive, it actually would have an impact on the problem. I mean, you've got three players here who between them could have an impact on the problem. If they were to cut their emissions by, I've got some illustrations there, if you've got some, cut, they cut their emissions by 60%, um, so if they cut the emissions by two-thirds, world emissions would drop by 40%. If they cut their emissions by 80%, then world emissions would drop by about half. So these three are between them enough to have an impact. So you know, maybe what we should be doing is reaching an agreement between these three uh, as a start. Um, and as you probably have read in the press recently, there was an announcement that, uh, in fact, sort of on the quiet, the U.S. has been negotiating with China uh, for the last year, uh, and that the recent uh, summit meeting in Asia, Obama reached an, uh, announced Obama and uh, Xi Jinping announced an agreement uh, in which China agrees to reduce its carbon dioxide emissions slowly, not by a huge amount, uh, but it's the first time they've ever consented to anything remotely like that. And it's the first time a major developing country has consented to anything remotely like that. Uh, so that's actually a very significant point. Um, now it's clearly much easier to reach an agreement amongst three countries than it is amongst 200, which is the, the number in the UNFCCC. Um, the European Union has already shown a great deal of willingness to act. The European Union has committed itself to very significant uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, what's interesting about China is that although its energy growth is very energy intensive, um, and they're very concerned about restricting that growth, they're also very threatened by climate change. What is, you know, the Chinese leadership understands the issue of climate change. A lot of them are technicians, engineers, they can read the literature, they know it's for real, they don't think it's bullshit like the Republican Party does. Um, so, you know, they take it seriously, um, and they're worried about it, and they have every reason to be worried about it. A lot of China is very, very low. Most of China's industrial areas in the south uh, west of China are within a few feet of sea level. So, I mean, they could lose an enormous amount from a 15, 10 to 15 foot sea level rise. And they're also exposed to tropical cyclones very heavily in the south, that, so that heavily populated industrial area of China. And in addition to that, they have major water shortages and changes in the hydrological cycle could hit China very seriously. So all the major industrial countries, and I think of China now as an industrial country, although they, they claim they're still developing, um, you know, China is probably one of the most vulnerable to climate change. And that's bad for them, but it's good for the rest of the world because it gives them an incentive to think seriously about this problem and to get to grips with it. Um, so they seem to be doing that. I mean, the Chinese government does seem to be genuinely moving in the direction of, of, of uh, replacing fossil fuels by other alternatives. And they also seem to see the development of a fossil fuel, in, of a, a renewable energy industry as a growth industry and one where they want to have a competitive advantage as, as the world goes forward. Um, so both the, of, the, of the three I just mentioned here, the EU and China, are certainly uh, committed to taking action on the climate front. Now, the weakest link in those three is actually probably the US. Uh, the US, as you perhaps know, is the biggest coal producer in the world. It's the biggest gas producer in the world. And according to the International Energy Agency, it will be the biggest oil producer in the world in a couple of years. So the US is actually by far the largest producer of fossil fuels in the world. It dwarfs Saudi Arabia. It dwarfs Russia. Uh, it is, you, know, you, you, are, you guys are living in a petro state. You, mean, you didn't probably didn't know it, but you are. Um, so um, now, what the, the, the saving grace here is, although the, the U.S. has these huge fossil fuel industries, uh, it also has an awful lot of other industry as well. Saudi Arabia has fossil fuel and it has nothing else, so fossil fuel dominates. Russia has fossil fuels and it has nothing else, so fossil fuels dominate. Fortunately, the U.S. fossil fuels make up only a small fraction of the U.S. economy, although they're absolutely huge by, by global standards. Uh, so there's so much else in the, in the American economy that we have some chance of, of getting action on this front. 
Although, you know, you can see it's politically contentious, and if you look at where the contention comes from, it's very clear it comes from people who represent the industry, you know, the fossil fuel industry. I mean, the voice of sort of oil and coal uh, is clearly what's speaking against fossil fuels, against, against sorry, in favour of fossil fuels and against uh, climate policy in the US. Anyway, so we have these three, which I think we could, uh, we could work with. Now, so far I've made a rather sort of pragmatic argument for uh, renegotiating with three countries rather than with you know, the best part of 200. Um, and I think that pragmatic argument is fairly convincing. But there's actually also a more theoretical or conceptual argument for this uh, based on game theory. I don't want to go into any detail on that. It's probably not the right venue for technical discussions on game theory. Um, but let me just give you a kind of very sort of high level, you know, 30,000 foot overview of the issue. Um, you can think of negotiations on climate change as, as a game played between the negotiators. You know, that's sort of fairly obvious. Um, and uh, games of this type between sort of many negotiators typically have lots of equilibria. Equilibria being situations that the system can come to rest at and stay at sort of indefinitely. Um, one of those equilibria is where we are today, where everybody does nothing, uh, no action is taken, and the problem just remains. Another possible equilibria will be ever, where everybody reaches some kind of agreement and takes action. Uh, and there may be other interactions, uh, other equilibria in between, but those are the two that sort of dominate in some sense. Um, and these are all equilibria in the sense of Paul Nash. I don't know whether any of you guys ever either read the book or saw the movie A Beautiful Mind, uh, Russell Crowe playing Paul Nash. Okay, well, Nash got his, his, uh, his Nobel Prize for coming up with a concept which is now called the Nash Equilibrium. And that's the idea that you use uh, in, in sort of justifying those statements that I just made. Uh, so think of Russell Crowe and Paul Nash when I'm talking about this, or John Nash when I'm talking about this, uh, this stuff. Um, so um, the basic theoretical proposition I want to make here, uh, which comes from, from Nash's work, uh, is that... Um, it may be possible to sort of shift a system which is apparently stuck at the bad equilibrium, which is where we are today, towards the good equilibrium, which is where we'd all like to be, at least I would like to be, and I think most of you guys would, uh, by persuading just a small group of players, a small group of countries, to change their policies from no action to action on the climate front. Um, and that you know, if you pick that group of countries right, and they're sufficiently influential, uh, then everybody else's best policy will also change and other people will feel compelled to follow them, uh, just in their own self-interest. Uh, we have what we call a, you know, such a group of countries would call, we form what we call in game theory a tipping coalition. They have the ability to tip the system from non-cooperating or cooperating to cooperating. Uh, and I guess what it takes there is a, hopefully a smallish group, but a very influential group. And that, there's a lot of evidence um, that that group I, I referred to, of China, the US, and um, the European Union, is such a group. I mean, they dominate world trade between them in almost every aspect. And they're very influential politically between them too, obviously. Um, so I mean, they have a lot of the characteristics that would make for such a tipping group here. Um, so there is actually a kind of conceptual reason, as well as a, a very sort of straightforward pragmatic reason, why I think it makes sense to work with a small group of countries rather than with every country in the world. Um, now, these conceptual arguments depend upon the idea that this sort of negotiating framework seen as a game is what we call, has what we call a mutual reinforcement property, which means that you know, one, when, when one country chooses to, uh, to adopt a positive policy on climate, climate issues, it makes this more attractive to other countries. And that does seem to be true, if you think about it, of the climate game. Um, so, for example, um, one of the reasons that people give against taking climate policy seriously in the West is it will put us at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis China. If China moves forward, that argument goes. Um, so I mean, one of the sort of main arguments is that against climate policy is that you know, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis other developing countries. Well, if China moves along with us, that argument simply doesn't go. It doesn't, doesn't hold any water. Um, so it's actually critically important there to get a other countries like China on board. Um, and it's, you know, if we were to get an agreement between a group as, as economically powerful as the US, the EU, and China, then they actually have a lot of leverage over other countries. I mean, they would have the power, for example, to say, if you want to trade with us, you have to follow our climate policies. And there are very few countries in the world that don't want to trade with that group, EU, US, and China, because they control probably, what, 70% of world GDP. Um, so they have a lot of leverage at that point. Uh, so they form a very sort of powerful bully pulpit. Uh, 
So I'm, you know, I think that the, the move that we've seen recently uh, towards the US collaborating with China uh, on uh, climate policies is absolutely right. It's the right thing to do. Uh, we shouldn't be relying on the UNFCCC. We should be moving on this bilateral negotiations. And I think that the, the, the recent announcement is good news. It's a very, it's a, it's a very preliminary form of agreement. I don't want to overstate it. Um, you know, the, the agreement that was reached was rather weak, but at least it's an agreement and it's a first step. Uh, and, you know, so everything starts with first steps, I guess. Okay, so um, we're doing the, we're moving in the right direction. We should extend these negotiations to include the European Union. Quite possibly, we are doing already that we don't, but we're not making that public. Um, and I frankly think it's very likely that we are. But this actually, although it's you know necessary, isn't sufficient. It's it's a good start, but it's not enough. Uh, what else do we want to do? We should actually also be negotiating about different things from what we're negotiating about. So far, we've been negotiating about what I call targets and timetables. You know, we'll reduce emissions by 20% by 2020, 30% by 2030, 40% by 2040, and all that type of stuff. All these politicians love these kind of alliterative targets, 20% by 2020 and so on. Um, that's really not the right thing to be negotiating about, I think. Um, what we should really be negotiating about is what actually has to happen, which is the deployment of clean energy technologies. And we solve this problem by moving away from fossil fuels. So that's what we actually need to be focusing on moving away from fossil fuels, and that's what we need to be collaborating on. So moving away from fossil fuels. Um, so we have to stop, we, have to, we, we solve the climate problem basically either by replacing fossil by non-fuel energy sources, or by doing something like capturing and storing the carbon dioxide, which comes out of fossil fuel sources. That's what's not called a CCS, CCS car, carbon capture and storage. Now, either of these would work. We could either do you know, non-fossil fuels or we could do fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. At the moment, the latter doesn't seem to be happening. I mean, the technology is there in principle to capture uh, the carbon that comes out of smokestacks of, uh, of power stations. Uh, we do that already for sulfur dioxide. Uh, back in 1990, George Bush, the, the, previous, you know, the early George Bush, uh, amended the US Clean Air Act uh, to put a prohibition on the emission of uh, sulfur dioxide uh, uh, by power stations. Uh, sulfur dioxide is, is generated when you burn coal containing a sulfur, goes into the atmosphere, it dissolves in water in the atmosphere and forms sulfurous acid, and it causes acid rain. Um, and the uh, 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act made that illegal, and now you, virtually every uh, power station smokestack in the country has what's called a scrubber on it, uh, which simply removes the, the, the SO2, the sulfur dioxide, as it comes up the chimney. That's a technology which is, is, is you know, that exists and is uh, it's quite effective, and um, you can remove 80 to 90 percent of the SO2 that way, and it's also quite cheap. Um, there are similar technologies, although more complex, for CO2, for carbon dioxide. So you can actually remove greenhouse gases that way too, but it would cost a lot more because uh, you can dissolve sulfur dioxide in water. Uh, CO2 has to be dissolved in ammonia, which is a lot more expensive. Uh, and it's harder to get rid of too, and the quantities will be much bigger. Uh, so a typical, for example, a big coal-fired power station uses about 10,000 tonnes of coal every day. It's a formidable number when you think about it. 10,000 tonnes of coal is probably a heap of coal the size of this building. Um, each tonne of coal produces two and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide when it burns, uh, because it binds with oxygen in the, in the atmosphere and the molecular weight of oxygen exceeds that of carbon, and the formula is CO2. Um, so each, each day a big power station produces um, 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's 7.5 million tonnes a year. So there's actually you know, there's thousands of power stations like that around the world. In fact, there's thousands in the US alone. Um, so that's a lot to capture and a lot to get rid of. It's a very different scale of problem from SO2. Um, but, you know, there's some in indication that the technology is possible and it actually could be possible to capture that stuff and store it. But anyway, at the moment, as I said, that's not happening uh, for uh, uh, reasons I don't fully understand, to be quite honest. Um, so it look, but what is happening is the development of clean energy sources. Um, so, for example, currently, the cheapest sources of electricity in the United States are wind, gas and solar. Uh, we measure the cost of electric power in terms of cents per kilowatt hour or dollars per megawatt hour. Uh, and if you look at the costs of wind, um, gas and solar, the cost of wind is roughly 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour. The cost of solar can be sort of 6.1 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, 
and gas is about six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, now, I've put in the, the qualification in the best locations because the cost of wind power depends very much on how windy your location is. The power of a wind turbine goes up with the cube of the wind speed. So you can double the wind speed, you can increase the power up by a factor of eight. Uh, so they're very sensitive to, to local atmospheric conditions. But in the center of the country, in the so-called high plains, uh, wind power is a very, very cheap and very efficient way of generating electricity. Unfortunately, not many people live there. So it's, you then have to track this, trunk this power you know, several thousand miles to the nearest demand sources. Uh, and that's expensive. Um, but um, it's still quite a, a competitive way of doing this. I mean, wind costs have come down 58% and solar 78% in the last five years, and they're still falling. Um, this is actually a diagram from uh, the website of Lazards, the investment bank. Um, they, uh, spend a lot of money, they spend a lot of their time advising people how to invest in the energy industry. And so these are not, these are not green people. These are, these are money people. Um, and those, as you will see, are the unsubsidized costs of energy. Uh, the levelized cost is a particular way of measuring cost. We don't need to get into that. But the, the key thing about this is that um, you'll see that um, solar power can be as little as $60 a megawatt hour, which is six cents a kilowatt hour. Wind can be as little as 3.7. Uh, $37 a megawatt hour, 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour, um, whereas gas is $61 a megawatt hour, um, 6.1 cents a kilowatt hour, and coal is $0.66 cents a, a, uh, um, a megawatt hour, $66, sorry, a megawatt hour. <coughs> so um, wind, solar, and, uh, wind and solar are as cheap as anything else at this point. And this is without government subsidies. Okay? Uh, after the subsidy, there are significant subsidies available for these, and after those subsidies, you can make money out of wind as little as zero cents a kilowatt hour. You can give it away free uh, and still make money from it. And solar, you can sell for as little as four or five cents a kilowatt hour uh, and make money. Now, you just for a sense of comparison, I don't know how many of you read your electricity bills carefully, but here in New York City, you're paying 20 cents a kilowatt hour for your electricity. Uh, so these are low prices. Okay. Um, so and the point is, the point I'm trying to make is that at this point, you know, wind and solar are competitive. Um, so the natural question is, you know, do we have a renewable future in front of us? If these things are competitive, will they take over the world? Uh, unfortunately, it's more complicated than that. And so, you know, there's those complications and resolving some of those complications that I think the, the negotiations between countries really need to be focusing on. Um, what are the complications? Well, certainly these things are spreading. This is actually quite an interesting figure. Um, this shows the solar photovoltaic market. What you've got up there is a bunch of companies whose business is to um, provide solar energy. Um, they, these are all companies, companies that are in the business of installing solar on rooftops and then selling the power that it produces to the owners of the roofs. Um, the biggest is Solar City. You may have heard of them. The chairman of their board is Elon Musk, the guy who runs the um, that's a Tesla company and is involved in some kind of SpaceX thing. Uh, I forget the details. Um, so the, but there's a bunch of these companies. They all start with Sun, as you can see on almost all of them. Solar City, Sun Run, Sun Power, Vivint, Sun Edison, Sun Jevity. And this is showing you the amount of money they have raised to finance the installation of solar power over the last few years. And basically what you see from this diagram is the last three years, they raised somewhere between six and seven billion dollars just to install solar panels on people's rooftops. Uh, and that the rate of increase is going is, is, is positive, it's going up. So raising roughly $2 billion a year on average for the last couple of years. And the next couple of years, they'll probably raise 3 or $4 billion a year to fund the installation of solar power on rooftops. And this is just, this is not because of subsidies. This is, this is commercially viable. There was a long article in the Financial Times a couple of days ago uh, based on an interview with the guy who runs Sunrun. Um, and he was saying, you know, the subsidies, they were asking him, does it matter that the Republicans may discontinue the subsidies? And he said, well, we'd love to have the subsidies, but we don't actually need them. Uh, you know, we can make money now without the subsidies. The cost of solar panels has come down so far. Uh, we can make money without the subsidies. I mean, just to give you some sense of how far it's come down, I teach my MBA students a course on uh, these things, energy stuff. And I started teaching this course five years ago. And when I started the course, in order, if you wanted to buy... A, uh, a kilowatt of solar power, um, sorry, yeah, you, you had to pay, uh, sorry, if, you, if you wanted to buy solar panels, you had to pay um, $8 a watt for the panels. So $8,000 for a kilowatt of capacity. Today, you can buy those panels for 70 cents a watt. 
It's an amazing drop, absolutely amazing drop in the cost of these things. That's why many of the US producers have gone out of business, of course. They can't make money at this price anymore. I mean, it's the Chinese who are making money at these prices. So the money industry is dominated by China and by Solar City, um, but uh, and by First Solar. Um, so there's a couple of US players left in the, making, the business of making these things. But um, the prices come down enormously. So the most expensive part of a solar installation now is actually the frames that the panels go on. Uh, you know, the metal frames that they go on, plus the inverters that take the direct current and change it into alternating current in order to feed it into the grid. You know, that's why we say that, you know, that, that, cost, that stuff costs more than the actual panel itself today, which is a huge change from just as little as six or seven years ago. Um, so this is, you know, this is a growth industry. It is growing. Um, this is the wind market, uh, big growth of uh, wind capacity in the US. If you take the last 10 years, for the last 10 years, over 80% of all new electric generating capacity in the US has been either wind or gas. Uh, in fact, it's been half wind and it's, you know, it's been 40% wind, 40% gas. All new installations in the US for the last decade. Uh, so we are now moving to, a, the US has been moving to a world where power is generated by a combination of wind and gas uh, with some legacy, so legacy nuclear. Um, and now solar is coming into that equation as well. Now, you, you can't, unfortunately, move away from the gas at this point, and I'll explain why that is in a second. Uh, but you can see a rapid drop, rapid rise in, in, in capacity installation. These things are actually quite interesting. You'll see the blip in uh, 2000, blip in 2002, blip in 2004. Those are the years when George W. Bush failed to renew the production tax credit. Um, the, you know, this, <coughs> there was, and until last year, there was a big subsidy in place for the installation of wind. And so people would time their uh, wind installations to get the, take advantage of that credit. And you can see that in 2012, 2013 too. The cred tax credit ended in 2013. So a lot of the installations which would normally have occurred in 2013 were brought forward into 2012 so they could pick up the tax credit. Um, but the absence of the tax credit is not expected to have a major impact in the long run on the rate of installation of wind capacity, and there's some, some forecasts at the bottom there on uh, the fork on future wind capacity additions in the US. Um, here's some similar data on solar. You know, solar capacity uh, been growing very rapidly. Wind capacity at the global level has been growing very rapidly. So the 18-year average growth rate of wind capacity, almost 30% a year. Uh, solar capacity growing even faster than that at the moment. Um, so these are very much growth industries at this point in the US and in China and other countries as well. Um, however, as I said, there is a limitation and this gives you some sense of what the limitation is. This is the output of all wind turbines in the United Kingdom for the first quarter of 2011. And you can see it's variable. It's putting it mildly, right? Um, so if you look at, can I get the cursor to move on this thing? No. computer doesn't seem to want to bring up a curse. Anyway, if you look at, let's say, look at January, uh, and you can see there's a huge spike when the, we're producing 1.5 gigawatts, which is a lot of power. Uh, but then it drops down in a matter of days from 1.5 gigawatts down to about a quarter of a gigawatt. Again, if you look at early March, there's a huge spike. Power production goes up to over 1.5 gigawatts and then drops down to about a quarter of a gigawatt again. Now, if you're running a grid, an electric grid, that's a nightmare. In an electric grid, you have to match demand and supply for electricity minute by minute, in fact, second by second. And if you have a big discrepancy between demand and supply, what happens? That's what happens. Uh, that's, if you look at that, that's obviously a picture of the United States at night. Um, but if you look up where New York ought to be, there's a big black patch, right? <coughs> Looks rather like the Gulf of Mexico. Looks at like the Gulf of Mexico, there's, there's Gulf, the Gulf of New York up there, right? So what happened? The date at the bottom should give you a clue. 14th of August 2003. You all remember what happened then, right? The lights went out over the northeast of the US. The lights went out over the northeast of the US. Why? Because demand exceeded supply for a sh couple of seconds somewhere in Ohio. And it caused the entire system to go down in the northeast. So that's why this kind of thing is a nightmare. It's every, every grid operator's nightmare. The wind output is unpredictable and can fluctuate massively. So you want to inv incorporate wind into the system, you've got to have some way of smoothing that out. And that's quite difficult. Uh, at the moment, there's two technologies we use for smoothing that out. Um, one is um, a backup, 
and the backup that's used in the US is gas. I mentioned that wind and gas have kind of gone hand in hand. You can, um, you can start up a gas turbine as fast as wind power can drop off. Uh, you can't actually start up a nuclear power station like that. Nuclear power stations take a long time to start up. Even a big coal-fired power station takes a long time to start up. But a gas turbine is essentially a jet engine. And as you guys all know, you can start a jet engine uh, in a matter of minutes. Uh, so most utilities that have a lot of wind also have a lot of gas turbines. And they bring the gas turbines in as the wind goes down, and they bring them out as the wind goes up. And they just have them there offsetting the wind to try to get a, a balance and, and keep the, the power output constant. Um, that's one technology. The other technology is energy storage. And energy storage, you know, what you, again, ideally what you'd like to do is not have to back up with gas because that's expensive. You've got gas turbines which are sitting there doing nothing for quite a long time. And that's economically unattractive. And also, of course, gas produces carbon dioxide. And the whole pur purpose of renewable energy is not to produce carbon dioxide. So the ideal thing would be to store some of this stuff. When you've got those big upward spikes, you store them. Uh, and then when the power drops away, you, you, you pull the energy out of storage. Now, right now, this is our principal technology for storing energy. Yeah, um, this is the way the US stores energy today. So that is a nice flat hill. Uh, someone has taken the top off it and dug a hole in it, filled that in with a reservoir. And then when there's spare electricity at night, you pump water from that river up the cut you can see just to the right of the reservoir and into the reservoir and you fill it up. And then during the daytime when you're short of electric power, you let that water run down and generate power for, uh, via hydroelectricity. Where is that? That's somewhere in Pennsylvania. <coughs> There's 32. This is what's called pumped storage. There's 32 of them in the US and about another 30 in Europe. Um, it's, uh, you know, so this is the way it works. You, know, you pump water uphill, you store it during night, and then you let it run down again in the daytime and, and uh, just generate hydropower. Um, so it's, you know, it's fairly low tech, um, and it has the obvious disadvantage that you need a nice flat hill near a river where nobody is using the top of the hill. Um, and we've only found 32 of them in the US and they've all been used so far. Um, so there's not much, it's not the kind of thing you can generalize. You couldn't really do this in New York City. So it's not, it's a, you know, it's a nice cheap way of storing energy when, you, when you're it's available, uh, but it's not a particularly scalable method. Um, now in Denmark, for example, 30% of their power comes from, uh, from wind uh, and they do the same thing. They don't do it in quite this way. Norway has a huge amount of hydropower. Uh, so much hydropower that it can't use it all. I mean, Norway burns no fossil fuels to generate electricity. Norway, in fact, is planning to go carbon neutral within the next couple of years. Um, and they have, they have spare hydropower. So whenever the wind drops in Denmark, they import hydropower from Norway. And when the wind picks up again, they shut it off. So they use, essentially, they, Denmark is using Norway as one of these pumped storage devices. Uh, and so is northern Germany, incidentally. Northern Germany uses a lot of uh, wind power, and they have the same connection. I mean, the connection through Denmark comes into northern Germany. So they're doing the same thing there. Um, so this is the, the dominant technology, unfortunately, for uh, storing energy right now. And it's, as I said, not scalable, and it's very geographically specific. You just can't do it in a lot of places. Um, there are better technologies in the making. What you'd really like to be able to do is use something like a battery. You know, we're all using batteries for storing energy right now, obviously, in our cell phones. Um, and there has been some limited development of really, really big batteries. I mean, batteries kind of the size of this room uh, for storing energy at the grid level. Um, but at the moment, they're so expensive that they're not attractive. Um, <clears throat> and they're not hugely efficient. You get out of them roughly two thirds of the power that you put in. So you lose a lot of energy in the round trip and they cost millions and millions of dollars. I mean, this, this San Diego Gas and Electric bought one recently. Uh, from a company called ABC Battery, ABC Systems, so A123 Systems, and they paid something like $60 million for a battery which will store the output of a wind farm for about three or four hours. Um, so it was, it's, it's, not so, it's so expensive it's not commercially viable. But um, there's a lot of companies out there that are claiming that within a few years they will have radically new batteries on the market. They'll be much cheaper, they'll be much, have much higher energy density and so on. So you know, maybe this problem will be solved that way. It's also possible to think about the use of hydrogen as a way of storing energy. So water consists of hydrogen and oxygen. If you've got spare electricity at night, and at night in many parts of the US, electricity is actually free. 
You know, during the daytime, you may be paying a lot. I mean, here in New York, for example, during the daytime in the summer, you might pay a dollar for a kilowatt hour of electricity. At night, it could be free, literally free. Um, in fact, there are places in the US where the price of electricity goes negative at night. You can actually be paid to take it because it's so expensive, because there's more power being generated than can be used, and it's actually expensive to close down power stations. So the power station will pay you to take its power. So you know, one of the things you could, in principle, do is use cheap electricity at night, run it through water, break up the water into hydrogen and oxygen, just let the oxygen off into the atmosphere, it's not a pollutant, uh, keep the hydrogen, and then use hydrogen as a fuel during the daytime. Um, and hydrogen can be used in things called fuel cells. Fuel cells are chemical devices that produce electricity by converting hydrogen with oxygen in the air to form water and gener generating electricity in the process. Um, they were developed initially by NASA as a way of fueling the space station, um, but they, uh, they've sold their patents to some commercial companies, and there are now companies out there that use fuel cells to produce power on a, on a big scale. For example, Google uh, has fuel cells powering several of its big server farms. So these things operate on a big scale, and they're, they're robust, they're industrial strength at this point. Um, they're no longer for spaceships. Um, so in principle, you could uh, imagine storing a power by kind of using, as I said, using cheap electricity, generating hydrogen, uh, using that in fuel cells the next day or sometime later. You have to be able to store the electricity and so on. You have to build a lot of fuel cells, but that's all technically possible. And it looks like uh, you know, power generated that way f using a fuel cell would cost you know, seven or eight cents a kilowatt hour, which is more than wind or solar, but roughly what it's cost today to use gas or, or, or coal. So it's, you know, it's, it's not a stupid number, but it's not a super competitive number. Um, so, you know, there's possibly, it's certainly possible that, you know, within the next five to ten years, we'll have good, serious technologies for storing power. But at the moment, that really is the big bottleneck to massive scale deployment of, of solar and wind power. Um, you know, the risk that uh, you have, the, the fact you have these huge fluctuations, as I showed you here in, in output, and the fact you've got a supply, you've got to keep a, a demand and supply matched continuously. And obviously, again, you can have the same thing with solar. Solar is much more predictable than wind. You know, we know when the sun rises and sets. So if you've got an area of the country which is fairly cloudless, I mean, solar is intermittent but predictable, which is different from wind, which is in intermittent and unpredictable. Um, but in areas where you've got cloud cover, solar can be unpredictable again. So, I mean, New Jersey has a very big, a very high level of solar installations. Uh, you know, if you, California has the most solar installations in the US, but somewhat surprisingly, New, New Jersey comes second. Um, I don't quite understand why. I don't understand whose idea that was. Uh, it's not you know, an obviously sunny state. I don't want to insult, insult anybody. Um, but it has the second largest number of solar installations after California because it has massive subsidies for solar installations. Um, a lot of New York banks have moved all their data centers from New York to, uh, to New Jersey, and they're powering them with solar power and then sort of reaping the tax the tax uh, deductions from that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that's, um, that's, I think, as I said, the, the main sort of back, the main uh, bottleneck to really large-scale deployment of renewables. Renewables have come down in price to the point where they are competitive. Uh, it is not economically harmful to switch from coal or gas to renewables. You can do it without any increase in costs, but you've got to take care of this intermittency issue. And at the moment, it's not so easy to do that. We, at the moment, we can do it okay because we're, we're using renewables only on a small scale. You know, about 10% of our electricity comes from renewables. But if we were to up that to 60 or 70%, then the issue would be much more, ma much more difficult to manage. So we need these new technologies before we can really solve the problem. Um, and you know, hopefully that will happen. But that's something we should be negotiating over. And that's the kind of thing that these climate negotiations should be focusing on. That's the bottleneck. Um, you know, if there's the political will, and there seems to be political will between the EU, China, and the US, then you know, this is the bottleneck, and we should be trying to remove this bottleneck. Uh, so rather than talking about you know, ta ta targets and timetables, we should be talking about how can we promote the development of renewables and the development of the technologies that support them. Uh, so that's, I think, where we really need to be going in terms of these negotiations. Now, there's one more obstacle, uh, which I'll just mention quickly, and then I'm sort of going to start wrapping up. Um, which is that renewable energy is very land intensive. Now, the US happens to be uh, an area, with a country with lots of land. I mean, so the US could actually produce all the power it consumes from renewable and from solar panels. 
and you'd need an area which is roughly the size of California, covered with solar panels to do that. Um, that might go down a bit as the efficiency of solar panels goes up, but it's a big area. I mean, the most you'd probably ever get it down to is maybe two-thirds of California, covered with solar panels. And that's a lot, but there actually is that kind of land unused in the US, and in the Southwest, too. Uh, so you know, if we covered a significant fraction of the Southwestern US with solar panels, we could actually power the entire US from solar, provided, of course, we could store the power and make it available at night, uh, which at the moment we couldn't. Uh, but if we could overcome that storage issue, we could get there. Um, but that's not so feasible, for example, for the UK. And I'm from the UK. Uh, the UK is a small, densely populated country. It doesn't have an enormous amount of sun. So solar power is not, a great, not particularly attractive there. Uh, the options there are essentially wind um, in terms of renewable energy. And uh, the you know, wind energy is not particularly dense in the sense that you know, the amount of wind power you can generate per square mile or per square kilometer is rather low. You'd actually need to cover the entire United Kingdom with turbine, with wind turbines, and then surround the entire coastline with turbines, and then surround that with turbines as well, in order to get enough power to meet current, current power needs in the UK. Um, so in a small, densely populated country, renewables are not that attractive. The same goes for Germany, incidentally. When I've seen calculations suggesting that Germany could not, I mean, Germany could not make more than sort of 20, 30 percent of its power consumption from renewables. Um, so small, densely populated countries need something else. Um, there are several options. You know, they could use nuclear power. Um, the UK is moving that way, but Germany is not. Uh, it's moving in the opposite direction. Um, they could use conventional fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage, which I was referring to before. Or they could import renewable energy from elsewhere, places which do have plenty of it. So, for example, the UK right now is putting in a long, uh, a long undersea electric cable from Iceland. Iceland has vast amounts of geothermal power. Now, Iceland is essentially a volcanic region, and if you pump water down 100 feet, it boils because the rocks are so hot, and you can bring it back up and run a steam turbine with it, uh, which is a nice cheap way of producing electricity. So the Icelanders want to export some of this, so they're putting, we're putting a long cable between Iceland and the UK, to, 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 and that's to transfer electricity to the UK mark grid. That's relatively inexpensive. It's also, of course, carbon-free. Um, and once it's in the UK grid, it can be transferred around the rest of Europe because the European grids are all interconnected. There was a big proposal um, to a number of German utilities were involved in to cover a significant fraction of the Sahara in uh, Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia with solar panels and use that to transfer as a source of power for Europe and then transfer that all to Europe. It's a project called Desert Egg. Um, and I think a couple of German utilities actually invested as much as $4 billion in that but the project was cancelled uh, earlier this year, um, largely, as far as I understand, because of the political instability in North Africa and the Middle East. And nobody wanted to invest another $20 billion uh, of their money in, in North Africa at this particular point in time. Um, I think that's probably understandable and it may change. But that's the type of thing you have to think about as ways of meeting the renewable energy targets in Europe. I mean, uh, Europe, to, to meet its targets, Europe either has to go nuclear on a bigger scale than many countries there are willing to, or it has to import renewable energy from somewhere else, uh, or it has to go fossil fuel with, with carbon capture and storage, you know, which is technically feasible but hasn't been developed very extensively at this point. There's one, there's about three power stations in the world that actually, uh, three fossil fuel power stations that actually capture their carbon and store it. One is run by Vattenfall in North Germany. One is run by SAS Power, the Saskatchewan utility, in Canada, it was opened earlier this year, and there's one in the US near Michigan. Um, so those are all started, well, the, the one in Vattenfall has been going for about 10 years, the one in Germany, the other two were started this year. So we don't have a huge amount of experience with these things, but they, 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 they do exist and they do operate. So it's, it isn't a possible option, but it's expensive. Um, coal is not the cheapest power source anyway, and with these car carbon capture and storage technologies, the price goes up quite a lot. Uh, so you'd be paying quite a lot for that power. Uh, but the other option is nuclear, and that's also quite expensive. The nuclear power here in the U.S. costs about 12 cents a kilowatt hour. Remember, I was telling you that wind is 3 cents, 3.7 cents, solar is 6, gas is 6.1, you know, coal is 7 or 8. So nuclear is about 12. It's expensive. Three, four times uh, what wind costs. Um, nuclear power stations are very capital intensive. Um, 
and that they have other issues as well, obviously. Um, but at the moment, it's just straightforward cost makes them unattractive. But you know, if you're worried about enough about climate change, maybe that's a cost you're willing to pay. Uh, that's something that which, uh, you know, countries have to make up their own minds around. Okay, so that's power generation. Now, just mention briefly the other big source of greenhouse gas emissions, which is, of course, transportation. Um, <clears throat> you know, roughly 40%, a bit under 40% of the world's emissions come from energy use in transportation, clearly mainly cars and trucks. Um, a growing amount from planes, but planes only contribute about 10%. So you now most of this stuff is, is cars and trucks. Um, here, the use of renewables is obviously more challenging. Uh, solar is out. Uh, there's no serious proposals for solar-powered vehicles. I mean, there are some test vehicles out there, but unless you can increase the efficiency of solar enormously, that doesn't seem real. Uh, so the options are electric vehicles of one sort or another. I mean, there's two types of electric vehicles out there. There's the battery-operated ones, which is the ones we read about, uh, Tesla and people in the red, and the Nissan, whatever it's called, Leaf and the Chevy Volt. Um, that's an established technology, but it's not. doesn't look as if it's about to take over the world at all rapidly. I mean, the batteries are expensive. You know, in a Tesla S costs you eighty thousand dollars, and of that eighty, the 40, 40 goes for the battery. Uh, and in a Nissan Leaf, the car, the car costs about thirty thousand, and the battery costs fifteen. So batteries are expensive, uh, and they don't last all that long, and they have to be recharged, and they take hours to recharge. So any of these batteries, are, and, it's, and on a standard, you know, household installation, would take overnight to recharge. You can recharge them in 25 or 30 minutes, but you need a very, very high voltage charger to do that. And even 25 or 30 minutes is a long time to people who are used to, uh, to, to, you know, to gas -powered, gasoline powered cars. Um, so, you know, the battery technology has to go a long way uh, before electric vehicles really are likely to take over uh, without a huge amount of subsidy. Um, the other option is electric vehicles which are powered by fuel cells. Um, so a fuel cell vehicle has a fuel cell generating electricity instead of a battery, and otherwise it's run by electric motors, just like everything else, just the other, the other ones. Uh, I mentioned fuel cells earlier. Uh, Toyota just released a fuel cell car, a sort of mid-market fuel cell car. Honda has one. Ford, uh, General Motors, um, Mercedes, BMW all have them in the making. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, but you know, it's the, it's actually, it's, it's, some of the electric cars are very nice looking, incidentally. That's the Tesla S, it's the BMW i8. These are both battery-powered cars. They're, they, get, they get rave reviews except for the fact that the, uh, they are expensive and the batteries take overnight to recharge. And their range is somewhat limited. This one has a range of about 200 miles uh, and then it takes you know, overnight to recharge. This one has a range of about 150 miles and then takes a long time to recharge. So although they look very sexy, uh, they're not going to be selling on a mass scale in the near future. Um, so battery, you know, a breakthrough, breakthrough in batteries is critical there, or as I said, the development of better fuel cell technologies, um, which is you know, beginning to happen, but still seems a long way off. Uh, the um, Toyota is very cagey about what it costs to produce the fuel cells for its vehicles it's selling now. A couple of years ago, the rumor was that the fuel cell in a, in a Toyota Camry uh, powered by fuel cells cost $100,000. They say they've reduced the cost very significantly, but it could still be costing $50,000. So that has to come down an awful long way before that's a serious alternative. So you know, the biggest, there's, a, there's a bigger problem in the, uh, probably in transportation than there is in generating electric power. We can generate electric power uh, by non-fossil alternatives right now on a quite a big scale. Uh, transportation poses a bigger problem. It looks like we'll be using oil in transportation for some time to come until we have much better batteries or, or much better fuel cells. Anyway, let me start to wrap up. I've, I've taken probably slightly longer than I should have done. Um, we go back to what I said at the beginning. You know, I think the present framework for negotiating on climate change is wrong, uh, that we need to be focusing on a small group of countries uh, that are really heavy emitters and that between them could take actions which really could cut back emissions. And I think that might be beginning to happen. Um, so although I'm pessimistic about the UNFCCC, I'm actually optimistic about the potential for reaching some sort of agreement in principle. Um, and I think we need to focus on improving the technology. Uh, I know the technology is the obstacle at this point. The technologies have improved massively in the last decade or so. I showed you how much prices have come down for wind and for solar. Uh, so there's remarkable achievements there. Um, but there's still technical obstacles. As I said, energy storage. We need to solve the energy storage problem. A good solution there would overcome both the, the obstacles to uh, use of renewable energy, 
in uh, power generation and also the obstacles to use of, use of renewable energy in transportation. So you could actually, to use a very unecological metaphor, kill two birds with one stone if you were to solve the storage problem. Um, so uh, that's basically my recommendations. We, you know, I think we, we have potential to reach an agreement. The problem is solvable. We may be doing the right thing for once uh, after doing the wrong thing for solidly for 20 years. And I'm mildly and guardedly optimistic. Thank you. Well, this was a wonderful and uh, uh, now at least a very optimistic view uh, on climate change. So we have uh, some of the technology is emerging and also the willingness to uh, do something is emerging. So with, his, with Jeff's uh, suggestion of uh, focusing on a few coalition, a uh, uh, few members in the coalition group. So uh, how this might work out within this coalition group, so within Europe, within US, within China, so this might be still another question, but I mean, it was a very uh, optimistic view and I guess there's a lot of uh, comments, so. Three, maybe three uh, questions first, and then Jeff okay. is answering. Otherwise, we will have a very quick. Uh, keep it on this side, and then go to that side. Maybe we'll do three here. So, Jeff, uh, you're, you didn't talk about energy efficiency at all, but on your Lazard chart, it showed that the cheapest thing you have of energy is more efficient use as opposed to new power generation. So, I just like your comments sure, on that. Yeah, right. Todd Coleman, uh, University of Sanglia, Tyndall Centre. Um, I agree with your overall analysis, and particularly the move away from UNFCCC into a small group of countries. Um, just to say that the UK is surrounding itself with wind power. Yes, yes. Where I live in Norfolk, uh, we have huge wind farms, but offshore. They're a long way offshore, and uh, we're banned from actually having wind farms onshore. But we will they Anyway, my question was again about something you didn't mention, which is tidal power. Uh, there is um, potential for the UK to produce 18% of its electricity from the seven bore alone. That's been held up by bird groups, the RSPB, who don't like the idea that the seven uh, uh, estuary has a large number of birds. I'm a member there. of the RSPB. Uh, indeed. <laughs> uh, but this has been on the stocks, and uh, there are other tidal potential. The, the uh, one outside Swansea, the right, one yeah, in Northern yeah. Ireland. There are the, uh, so I think that the UK is sorting it. What my worry is whether the United States is going to take a grip on this and whether the Republicans will allow uh, the negotiations to go forward in Paris. Okay. Um, My question is also about the U.S. government. We know what the U.S. government did to develop uranium after World War II. We know uh, what the U.S. government did to develop the Internet. Uh, aside from what the Congress is doing, my understanding is there are uh, investigations to develop just the kind of technologies you're talking about, but I don't know what they are. Do you know what they are? Okay, um, so energy efficiency, tidal power, and uh, development of new technologies. So, yeah, so there's uh, some controversy about energy efficiency. Um, that uh, um, chart I showed you uh, basically is drawing on a study by McKinsey's on the issue of energy efficiency. And McKinsey's has a famous uh, McKinsey cost curve showing the cost of cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and a lot of that is based on their assessments of energy efficiency. Um, it appears, though this is, as I say, controversial, that a lot of the assumptions in that are very optimistic. Um, so, for example, there was recently a very thorough study of the, um, you know, the, the, the recent, you now the, the 2008 stimulus bill provided a lot of money for energy efficiency. And um, under that program, a lot of houses in the Michigan area were weatherized and their efficiency was improved. Uh, and there was a study recently of 8,000 houses that were uh, efficient, whose efficiency was improved under the stimulus program that were compared with 8,000 comparable houses that weren't improved. It was a very detailed study. And the conclusion of that study was that, roughly speaking, the savings in energy from the uh, energy efficiency measures were about 
one third, or at maximum one third, of those forecast by the engineering models. Um, and by the, and those engineering models are what the McKinsey uh, study and, and the, the, the Lazard people are using. So I, I have sort of, I'm, um, I also have several students, several ex-students of mine who've started companies focusing on energy efficiency, trying to improve energy efficiency in large buildings. And there certainly is some low-hanging fruit there. But the general conclusion these guys are coming to is that it's much harder to improve efficiency in buildings than a lot of people have thought. And there's, you know, there's, it's not just the technology, it's behavioral issues as, people as well. People run buildings, and people aren't always willing to change their habits in the ways that are required to make some of those models work. But I think there, I think there is a lot of scope for improving uh, energy efficiency, but I don't think it's as big as some of these guys think. And I don't think it's as cheap as some of these guys think. Now, on tidal power, yeah, I, I didn't mention tidal power because there is, at this point, there is no tidal power that is commercially viable. Nobody is providing tidal power and making money out of it. Um, I only want to mention things that actually can survive in the marketplace on their own. Whether tidal power will get there, I mean, there's, I guess there's two points of, there's two, sorry, there's tidal power and there's wave power, right? And they're different. Um, so I was referring to wave power. I mean, I'm, at this point, there's no wave power machines that are commercially viable. In fact, there's no wave power machines that are even robust enough to survive in a heavy sea, as far as I can see. Um, the tidal bore issues are different. I was actually reading about the one in Swansea. My, my family comes from Carmarthen, which is not very far from there, so I'm very familiar with that. Okay. Um, yeah, that looks interesting. Um, and the problem with that, as with many renewables, is it's kind of geographically very specific. You need the right geographical configuration. And the UK happens to have a number of areas where these tidal bores could be quite, quite, quite productive. Um, but I, you know, I do take the um, environmental side effects of the seven bore issue quite seriously. Um, I was a lifetime member of the RSPB when I lived in the UK. And I'm still a keen bird watcher. So I don't kind of write off the ecological consequences of that type of thing too lightly. But it is certainly true that, I mean, the, I think the, Kamar, the, the, uh, the Swansea one is a very interesting project. Um, and there's a couple of projects like that being mooted in the US at the moment too. Whether they can ever contribute much in the US, I'm not sure, um, and I, so I, I'm just not certain how, how scalable these are, but I mean, they're certainly viable in principle. Yeah. Um, what's going on in the federal government about uh, energy research? Um, at this point, not a lot. Uh, most of the, uh, <clears throat> so the Department of Energy has given a number of grants to battery companies. Um, and you know, most of the research on battery, batteries and energy storage is being funded by venture capital. So there's the biggest single <clears throat> deployment of venture capital at the moment is into energy storage. I mean, I keep on telling my students that the next Bill Gates will be the guy who solves the energy storage problem. Um, and I think the venture capitalists see that too. So there's a lot of private capital going into energy, energy storage, uh, but not a huge amount of government money at this point. Not even the Defense Department, which is often where it comes Yeah, um, the Defense Department has been pushing renewable energy very aggressively. Um, the Defense Department, someone in the Defense Department once told me that by the time they get a gallon of, you know, during the war in Afghanistan, by the time they got a gallon of gasoline to the front line in order to power their tanks uh, up in some remote area of Afghanistan, it cost them $400 per gallon. So you're paying $400 a gallon for gasoline and you're running a tank, you know, which presumably uses a gallon of gasoline every couple of hundred yards. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, it's also just a strategic nightmare too, because again, apparently, when they invaded Iraq, uh, you know, the, the insurgents would never attack the U.S. tanks or troops. They'd wait for the petrol tankers to come through. And when the petrol tankers came through, which were much slower and not heavily armoured and very obvious, you can't really disguise a petrol tanker. They would just hit them with rockets, and they knew that if they knocked out the petrol tankers, they'd effectively knocked out the tanks too. So the, the U.S. Army is actually very sensitive on this issue and would very much like to be able to have, you know, solar-powered tanks or whatever. Well, that's clearly our battery-powered tanks, at least, um, with solar electricity to, 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 to store in them. Um, so they've actually, they have funded a lot of the research on solar and they are funding some research on batteries. But at this point, most of the battery research, as it, the, a couple of startup companies have got, like, you know, grants for a few million dollars from the DOE, Department of Energy. But most of it's private money at this point. A lot of it's actually Chinese money. Um, a lot of the US startups are funded by Chinese money, believe it or not. And in fact, some of the Chinese startups are funded by US money. So Warren Buff, one of Warren Buffett's bigger investments recently was in a Chinese battery company. I forget its name. Um, so, you know, it's, it's going, the money's going both ways on quite a big scale. Yes, right, yeah, yeah, BYI, yeah, yeah.
Hi, I'm Becky Hollander. I'm a PhD student here at the New School. Um, when we talk about climate change, we're talking a lot more about the environment and about emissions. Uh, we're also talking about socioeconomic and political structures that foster inequality around the world. Um, so when I'm encouraged by the possibility and the potential that these technologies have for reducing greenhouse gases, um, I also recognize that they allow uh, our current model of consumption to continue, which certainly might be more feasible than, than reducing consumption. However, I'm also concerned about how these technologies could either help or hinder the fight against poverty and inequality. Uh, when I think about them, I think about the material requirements. Um, I'm most familiar with lithium for batteries, but I know there's other material requirements for some of these technologies. Um, and the labor that goes into producing them, um, and what this means for, for access, energy access for people around the world that, that don't have energy. Um, so any way you could touch on sure. this topic. Energy. Why do you assume I'm going to be too long? Uh, well, uh, actually, my, my, my question is connected to, to what was just said. Uh, I, I have one worry concerning your proposal. Uh, and I'm thinking about the, the NPT treaty, the, the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, the, the, the issue is, uh, is this. I mean, if we have a few countries, be they the most concerned countries, to start a regime, an international regime governing the, the climate. The problem you'll have, especially if you think about game theory, is that at some point, any new actor coming whose interest is not in that regime has a lot of incentive to get out of the regime if the, the country is already in, or not to join the regime. Now you have an issue of having an international regime that has serious issues of legitimacy the same way you have this problem with the non-proliferation treaty. And because, and the way it's connected with what was said before is that the fact that we only have few countries that can negotiate um, a, a, a treaty on, on climate change, it's not something, I mean, it has an explanation also. It is linked with the fact that uh, it's linked with issues of you know, inequality in the world in terms of wealth development and so on. And uh, so if we have only those countries because of their economic uh, weight or the only one that are going to design a regime that takes only in consideration or mostly in consideration their interest, then we might have a huge problem of legitimacy later on. Uh, thank you. I really appreciated your remarks about the uh, UNFCCC COPs, and having gone to some of them, I certainly agree that they're not highly functional. Um, but I think one of the reasons that they get so much attention is because it's very clear. It's a very elaborate institutional process. It's clear who is involved. The governmental parties, the analysts at NGOs and think tanks and elsewhere who inform those processes, not so much the private sector. So um, I, I agree, certainly we need a, new, need a new model, and I think your ideas are very provocative, but what are your reflections on the institutional mechanisms that will be necessary to take these three blocks and have them do this kind of collaboration you mentioned to achieve something that really is going to be much more distributed, um, is going to require much more robust involvement from private sector, both on the technological side and the finance side. So um, having looked at these issues quite closely, I'd be interested to, to hear your reflections or maybe speculations about how you see this playing out. I think there were three questions there about energy access, about this issue of legitimacy, and then institutional structure. Um, so energy access is promoted by the development of, of certainly of uh, distributed technologies. So in particular, for example, I mean, I think solar power, power is very good for poor communities in developing countries. Um, it's a lot cheaper to provide solar panels to villages than it is to provide a central power station on a grid. Um, so my wife and I, my wife's at the back in the audience at the moment, we went to up the Amazon a few years ago. Um, and, you know, if you go into the forest uh, up in uh, so Peru, for example, in the, off the Peruvian Amazon, into the villages there, the villages there have solar panels. Um, and they produce enough power, they, they, they use the panels to, to charge not, not lithium-ion batteries, just car batteries, old lead-acid car batteries. And they can generate enough power to store uh, so they can run the lights at night. 
and they can run a refrigerator all day to store medicines and things like that. Um, and they say it's much better than the old diesel generators they used to have. Diesel generators, they have problems getting the fuel in and out, they used to break down and so on. Um, these things are much better. And the World Bank has been very aggressively promoting the use of solar panels as, as a way of distributed power generation in developing countries. Um, and you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's much of remote rural areas are going to get power from solar a long time before they get power off an electric grid fossil, powered by fossil fuel. So in that sense, it's, it's good for energy access. Um, you know, distributed power, which is cheap uh, and can be put in on a small scale locally, uh, is a good way of generating, of improving energy access. Um, there's no question about that. I mean, was you know, sort of capital intensive centralized power stations with very, very expensive grids. I mean, putting up a grid, for example, that removes power over long distances. Here in the US, costs about $3 million a mile. Uh, so if you want to put in a central power station and then feed everybody who's within, say, 100 miles of that, uh, not only you have the, the capital cost of the power station, which will be in billions, um, but you have to, the capital cost of the grid as well. And if you're running, you know, 1,000 miles of grid, which you could easily be in a 100-mile circle, uh, then you're looking at several, you know, maybe 10 to 5 to $10 billion just for the wiring. Uh, so this is expensive stuff. So what's nice about solar is if you haven't got a grid in place already, then the capital costs of solar are really quite low by comparison with that entire package. Uh, so I think, I think actually solar will, I think, be good for energy access. And energy access is obviously a big issue. Uh, at least in the tropics, at least in areas where you've got, you know, you, you've got uh, solar. I mean, and, and most, I guess, most poor countries are, in fact, in the tropics or subtropics and have some solar power options. Um, so the second question was about legitimacy and so on, um, using talking with reference to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, you know, my sense is that um, there will be an issue of legitimacy and there will be countries that will oppose this. As I said, there are countries which have enormous vested interests in the use of fossil fuels. And I named a couple, and that's, they're fairly obvious, and there's, there's more which are obvious. I mean, the whole of OPEC uh, are presumably going to be opposed to this, uh, plus, plus Russia. Um, so I don't expect unanimity on this, but I do expect that the majority of industrial countries and many developing countries will agree to something like this. You know, if, if the three I, I, I referred to reach an agreement, I think a lot of the rest of the world would want to join that agreement. Um, and you know, the, the nature of the agreement would really be one, would be an agreement to deploy renewable energy and to support the development of renewable energy. And ultimately, that's in the interest of the rest of the world too, because it'll bring the cost of renewable energy down further. So if they're successful, they should actually make it easier for other people to join. Um, institutional mechanisms for this, you know, I haven't, that's not something I've really thought about a great deal. Um, you know, I imagine that actually um, what would happen would be that the, uh, you know, if, if things were to go the way I'm suggesting, that the three groups concerned would reach an agreement, uh, would invite other countries to join that agreement. Uh, part of the agreement would be developing new technologies, and part of the offer would be you can share these technologies, you know, we'll make these technologies available to you. Um, and that the threat would be that if you don't do this, we'll put carbon tariffs on your goods when they cross our borders. Um, and that's something which has been discussed in the past. Um, Europe, both the European Union and the US have discussed putting uh, sort of carbon tariffs on the ball, on imports from countries that don't meet sort of carbon emission standards. Uh, and that would be a very significant threat to countries that wanted to trade with that group. And as I said, that group controls roughly 70% of the world economy. So most people would want to trade with them. Uh, that's not a terribly friendly way of doing it, but that, I guess, is the way things often happen in, in international negotiations. You talked about obstacles in international uh, cooperation. I'm thinking about within one nation, especially developed countries like the US or the EU, uh, have there been obstacles coming from within the countries, you know, perhaps but with, from well-established organizations that, you know, have ripe from fuel and fossil, uh, fossil energy um, in, you know, lobbying or other ways of actually preventing these measures. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you uh, outlined some of the strategies for 
three countries in particular. And just it reminded me, uh, I don't know if you saw this article in the New York Times Tuesday uh, about the Indian uh, yeah. 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 coal. Uh, I, I think there the strategy might be to uh, not so much emphasize the global warming, but emphasize the pollution and the, and the changes in the landscape. And India probably is not atypical in that sense. You know, many of the poor countries probably don't pay as much attention to the potential global warming, but more attention to what's the pollution, local pollution. So that might be yeah. one strategy for India. Um, hi, I'm Kate Gruz. I'm an international affairs graduate student. And I was just wondering, you mentioned that the price of solar power has gone down a lot, um, especially in the US, because China is able to produce the infrastructure at much cheaper rates. And I'm wondering the effect of, because all of that infrastructure still has to be shipped from China. And so I wonder if that the emissions from that shipping kind of negates the fact that the solar power is being used here. And so I know that has a lot to do with free trade and the WTO agreement. So I just wanted, to, wanted your comments on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so let me deal with that one because I've seen calculations on that. So the answer is that um, solar, I mean, the, producing solar panels is pretty energy intensive. You have to heat silicon and melt it. And silicon melts at rather high temperatures. So a lot of energy goes into that. Um, but the sort of, you get the energy back within about two years of use of the panel. And the amount of energy used in shipping is a very small fraction relative to the energy used in actually constructing the panels and, and melting the silicon and shaping the silicon and creating the silicon wafers. Um, so, um, yeah, but you need to, so the first two years are sort of used paying back the debt, if you like, from the manufacturer of the, of the silicon. But after that, it's, it's, it's uh, clear. Um, India, pollution. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's correct. Um, I think the, the Chinese motivation for taking action on coal is precisely a mixture of the two. I mean, China, you know, the sort of pollution levels in China are awful, um, and they're seriously affecting people's health. There was a very interesting study pr pr published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year by a guy called Mike Greenstone, who's an econometrician here in the US, and two guys from Tsinghua University in China, where they estimated that coal pollution in China takes 5.5 years off the life of the average Chinese citizen. So now the average Chinese person lives 5.5 years less than they would do if all coal burning was stopped in China. That's really quite a dramatic number. Um, and uh, you know, that's not totally surprising if you've seen the pollution levels there. And I've, 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 according to the Times, pollution in India is worse than pollution in China. I find that difficult to believe, but it, it is, I see, okay. So in that case, the numbers for India must be truly mind-bending. Um, and um, I'm sure in that case, at some point, there will be domestic pressure in, in India to stop using coal. Um, but I guess that people are just simply not conscious enough uh, as yet of the, the dangers of coal. I mean, coal is a, uh, you know, one of the things I tell my students again is that you know, coal is a very dangerous substance. Uh, and we talk about um, the risks from nuclear power. Far more people are killed by coal every year than nuclear. You know, just coal mining. I mean, if you look at coal mining statistics for the world, roughly between five and 10,000 people die in coal mining accidents every year. Not in this country, obviously. Uh, we have you know, health and safety inspectors who generally stop that. Not always, but, but generally. But in China alone, you know, between five and 6,000 people die from mining accidents each year. And I'm sure a lot of people die in India too, uh, and in the rest of the world. So coal mining alone, just the mining process is dangerous. Then when you've burnt the coal, it has absolutely disastrous effects on people's health. I mean, here in the US, the American Lung Association on their website a couple of years ago had an article estimating that I don't know, about a million people die a year in the US because of pollution generated by burning coal. I mean, a big, a really big number. Um, so this is a serious issue. I mean, the, the sort of health consequences of coal are grossly under, under discussed. And there's, you know, I mean, there's a, a strong reason for banning coal totally just based on the health and forget the global warming issues. Uh, and I think that's what, that's, as, as, as you were saying, that's really what I think is driving the Chinese in this particular case. I mean, they can, you know, they sort of, uh, well, they've got a double motive. I mean, they've got the global warming motive and they've got the, the domestic health and politics motive. Um, so I'm taking these questions backwards, aren't I? Um, obstacles, yeah, ob political obstacles uh, in, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, I think I mentioned in the talk that the, uh, most of the obstacle ob obstruction uh, of um, 
climate policies in the US comes from, uh, from the fossil fuel industry. I mean, there's a you, lot of journalists have traced down um, very clearly the, um, the connections between uh, the fossil fuel industry and the, the anti-climate change, the climate change skeptics. Um, there's that very good book by um, Naomi Orestes, who was at San Diego. I forget, what, what's the title? Is any other title of that book? It's a kind of, it's a very good expose of, pardon? Merchants of, Merchants of Doubt, that's it, yeah, right. It's a great book called Merchants of Doubt. You should read it if you haven't. Uh, it's uh, Naomi Oreskes, actually was at San Diego when she wrote it, but she's at the Kennedy School at Harvard now. Um, and it's a study of the political operatives uh, who have been generating skepticism about climate change and who they are, where they come from, and how they're funded. It's a really fascinating book. Um, and you know, the scale on which they've operated and the funding that they've obtained is absolutely massive. Um, and in Germany, for example, um, there's been a lot of opposition to climate change policies on the part of the automobile industry. I mean, German automobiles are very nice cars, but they have big engines. Um, and uh, you know, they stand to lose from climate change policies. You know, the, the Europe has been implementing, uh, the European Union has been implementing policies which restrict vehicle emissions, just as the, the EPA has here in the US. And the strongest opposition to that in Europe has come from uh, the people like Mercedes and BMW, who make lots of big cars. Um, and uh, they have persuaded Angela Merkel uh, to back them in some of the European negotiations on this. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, there is, you know, there are, each country has its own particular lobby. Uh, that's involved in these things. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the UK doesn't have much of one. I mean, the UK doesn't. I mean, you has, has a few rather idiotic climate skeptics, but um, it doesn't have a big fossil fuel industry. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm talking off the cuff now. <laughs> um, and it has, um, you know, it has a few guys, a few climate skeptics, but there isn't really much of a fossil fuel industry left because North Sea oil is pretty much dead. Um, and there isn't much of an auto industry there. You know, it produces a few thousand Rolls Royces a year, <laughs> but it's not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a major industry. I promise not too long. Yeah, not too long. <laughs> Clearly what the message, the messages that the planet is giving us are, are finally providing an incentive for some movement. I was, uh, sorry, what the message that the planet is giving us is finally providing enough incentive for some, uh, some movement on, uh, on the whole climate change and renewables uh, issue. I was wondering about the, um, the 20% figure that you gave for U.S. emissions, that it's gone down a bit. But if I understood you correctly, that's just CO2. Is that correct? Okay, well, what I'm, what I'm getting at is this, that very often these calculations seem to exclude methane. And there's the permafrost melting, there are the methane hydrates from the ocean floor, and not just from the Arctic, but now from the eastern seaboard, and with the, the enormous build-out of gas through fracking, pipelines alone, not talking about compression stations or condensate tanks, the pipelines alone emit a uh, leak anywhere from 3 to 17% uh, methane directly into the atmosphere. Uh, I'd appreciate a comment on that. I'm using this to take notes, guys. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the current negotiating process uh, in the framework of the Rio Convention and the COP process calls for the major emitters to make pledges in the next few months about what they're going to do, and then for the countries to mutually critique each other and try to get them to improve their pledges. All right. So China has made this pledge just now with the United States that it will peak its emissions in 2030. It's plain to see, if you do a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation, that that pledge is compatible with, let's say, six degrees warming Celsius in this century, not two degrees, which is the official objective. So that pledge needs to be radically improved. It's, you know, if you just think about the amount of emissions that are come, there are increased emissions from China alone between 2015 and 2030, they're just staggering and they're yeah. catastrophic. So my, my question to you is, and it's really the main point of your talk, I don't really see why you think that the United States and Europe bringing pressure on China alone 
will yield, you know, stands a better chance of getting China to radically improve that pledge than all the countries of the world meeting in Lima and Paris next year, which is what the process calls for. Okay. Hi. Um, um, I'm just going to, uh, th this is one thing about uh, efficiency, but uh, one thing about conservation. So I think, you know, the conservation uh, of, uh, you know, uh, energy dollar is uh, better than, conserv you know, the, uh, the alternative uh, energy dollar. Uh, second thing, um, what I wanted to say is, uh, uh, you know, what about the direct solar and uh, direct uh, wind? Uh, what I mean is not to convert or to store the energy, but directly use it, you know, without... Uh, uh, what's happening is in India, I'm, I'm an expert on green building. I was one of the first LEED certified consultant in India. And uh, I, I'm one of the consultants for the greening of the UN headquarters, where we are using all kind of uh, international standards for the greening, you know, whether that's Australian standards or British standards. What we did in India is like in a hospital, we converted direct solar. There's no battery backup or inverters. So basically fans and motors are working directly. We could do that in India, but when I tried to sort of do it here in New York, you know, we are not able to do it. For example, there's a hydrogen fuel cell generator on top of the four times square, but you know, it's not of the grid. So that's my question, like why that is, uh, why, you know, I think this is very viable, but it's not happening. Quick question on uh, the, the co how do we pay for all these things? I work with the UN general uh, NGO community and the uh, the, the politics is a need for comprehensive solutions to humanity's problems, the cost of war, the cost of eating, the cost of balancing our budgets in the EU as well as the US, uh, the need to revision the UN as we did after World War II. Okay. Um, let me deal with that question a lot first, uh, as it's fresh in my memory. So, I mean, the, the important point about the data I showed you uh, about the costs of renewable energy, and that it's cheaper without subsidies than coal. The important point about that is it doesn't cost to replace coal by renewable energy. I mean, you're saving money in the long run. You have to make the upfront investment, obviously. But you have to be making investment anyway, because most coal-fired power stations are fairly old, with the exception of China. China, unfortunately, has a lot of new coal-fired power stations. Uh, so that's, that's an issue. Um, that relates to the second question. Um, but in principle, you can replace uh, a lot of fossil fuel capacity by renewable capacity uh, and actually save money in the long run. Uh, you know, you, it requires a lot of upfront investment, so that you require funding for that. But again, that funding should be available commercially. I mean, at the moment, you know, the... It's commercial money that's driving the spread of renewables, not government money. I mean, most, if you look at renewables in the US, um, most of them are being funded by pension funds, insurance companies, people who want to invest for the long term. Um, so most wind farms are owned by insurance companies and pension funds, and they're putting billions of dollars into that. Uh, and I showed you some data on how much money people like Solar City and Sunrun and Sungevity are raising. So they've raised about $6 billion in the last couple of years. Again, most of that money is coming from commercial entities. It's not government money. It's, it's insurance companies, pension funds, stuff like that. Um, so these guys see this as a good, in, a good investment. Um, so as long as it appears to be a good investment, the money will be there for it. Um, now, you know, once you get to developing countries, the available capital is less. But again, I mean, the point I made earlier to answer to an earlier question is that the um, capital requirements for distributed power generation via solar in developing countries are actually less than the capital requirements for conventional power systems. I mean, it's rather like, I mean, you remember you know, what happened with, with, uh, with cell phones in developing countries. I mean, most developing countries have gone from having no phone system to having a cell phone system without ever having a landline. Why? Because the cell phones are just less capital intensive than landline systems. Um, so that's going to happen uh, with solar power in a lot of developing countries. You're going you're to sort of jump over the grid. You're going to bypass the grid stage. Um, you know, it requires capital. I mean, the, 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 
to get energy to developing countries requires a lot of capital, and they don't have that capital. It, I think it will require less capital to do it cleanly than to do it dirtily, um, but it will still require a lot of capital. Um, and so that, you know, that, that doesn't, I mean, I don't think it makes the problem any worse, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, issue of conservation um, and the sort of regulations surrounding conservation. Um, you know, I'm not sure that I understand all the US regulations on that. Um, they're very complicated, and they vary when they vary. I mean, the, whole, the whole energy efficiency, the whole, whole issue of energy, and energy regulation is actually a mess in the US. It varies from state to state. Most regulations are not at the federal level. They're at the state level. And um, they vary, for example, they vary hugely between New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Uh, so you see people moving their energy installations from New York to New Jersey or up to Connecticut or off to Massachusetts uh, just to take advantage of different, different regulatory regimes. Um, and again, you've got in the southwest, you've got a bunch of states that are all heavily into solar power, but they all have different regulations. So people are putting up installations in Nevada to power California because the regulations in Nevada are better than the regulations in California. Um, so it's a mess, unfortunately. Um, and there's, and it's not just at the state level, too. I mean, there are actually cities that have their own regulations, like New York City in particular. And I think you're alluding to some of the New York City regulations. Um, so I, I'm afraid I don't know a lot about that. Uh, China, and the, yeah, so China's, as I said several times, China's pledge is weak, but it's the first time they've ever made a pledge. So it's a good start. It needs to be strengthened. Um, and, you know, if uh, the solar, you know, if the costs of renewable energy come down enough, uh, it probably will be strengthened. Um, I think there's enormous pressure on China for the kind of health reasons I was talking about before to reduce their use of, of, of coal. Um, so I think they will reduce the use of coal as fast as they can. Um, but it will require some evidence that the U.S. is going to take action uh, for that to happen in China. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that's where the U.S. needs to be focusing its attention on a deal with China. Um, persuading China uh, that that's a good thing to do and that they'll, the U.S. will be sort of friendly and, and making offers in other areas to, to sort of encourage that. Um, methane, leaks in methane carrying. Yes, so the, um, there's me multiple so Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's about 100 times more powerful than, than CO2. Uh, on the other hand, it has a half-life of about 15 to 20 years. Uh, so CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a very long time. Methane oxidizes to CO2 within you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, so a flux of methane now leads to a big increase in short-term warming, but 50 years from now it's gone and it's, turned to replace, it's been replaced by CO2, which has the sort of the same impact as, as any other form of CO2. Um, so methane is a short-term problem. That doesn't mean it's not a problem, um, but it's a, it's a short-term problem. And if methane, if we get leaks from methane from fracking, which is an issue, certainly an issue with fracking, um, but we tighten up within 10 years. I personally wouldn't be enormously worried about that um, because by 2050 that methane would all have gone. Um, methane from uh, permafrost is a bigger issue and there seems to be quite a bit of debate in the scientific community and I'm not an expert on that as to how much methane, if any, is being released from the permafrost. I mean, I've read some very um, perturbing statements about the release of methane from the per permafrost and I've also read a recent scientific paper saying that they were all totally off beam and that there's no evidence, significant evidence of methane being released from the permafrost as yet. So I really don't quite know what the issue is there. I mean, for those of you who are not into this debate, there's a lot of, but there is supposed to be a lot of methane frozen in the ground in the permafrost regions of Alaska, Canada, and Siberia. It's decayed vegetable matter from many years back, uh, but it decayed and then it was frozen and the methane is frozen in with it. Methane freezes at, uh, uh, it doesn't, the methane itself doesn't freeze, but it's caught in the frozen ground. Um, and so as the ground melts, it may be released. Um, and there sort of seems to be a lot of debate about just how big an effect this will be. Um, you know, for a while I was reading only very alarmist pictures on this, suggesting that you get a huge flux of methane as the permafrost melts, which it is beginning to do, obviously. Um, I mean, the temperature in the sort of annual average temperature in Alaska has risen by 4 degrees centigrade. Uh, in the last 50 years. That's a really big increase. Um, so, um, so you're really seeing the side effects there. Ironically, the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline, which brings all the fossil fuel down from Alaska, is actually beginning to sink into the ground. <laughs> it, was built, it was built when the ground was frozen. As the ground is melting, it's sinking into it. Uh, and they're having to put a lot of money into it to strengthen that pipeline. Uh, but anyway, the, the answer to that question about methane is I, I don't know. There appears to be a scientific debate about 
exactly how much methane there is in the permafrost. And um, I'm not sure I can take sides on that. Yes, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. <laughs> Particular, a very quite optimistic view on uh, new coalition formation that hopefully will take place and uh, new upcoming technologies that seem to be available or in the transition to become available. So uh, I think we want to um, post your uh, lectures on the CPAC, is this possible, yeah? Sure. No, okay, because I think these two measures it's on coalition formation and the technology should be also coming out and go to the public. So thank you very much. Thank you.